the opening chapter of my book is riding out in the morning in the dark and riding up the Spurs Mountain on our way out to wherever we're going to gather cattle. We'd be bundled up, it'd be blown and howling. All you would see was the glow of cigarettes and sparks flying off the horse's hooves because we were climbing up in some volcanic ground and being tucked in almost in your own world in a big jacket, trying to stay warm and stay on your horse and not even talking much, maybe talking about the Dodger game. That image of climbing that mountain in the dark, sparks flying, I wish I could make the picture for somebody. You know, I'm the fourth generation out here. I long for those old days and I really miss them because they were quite special. I mean, you can imagine not many people were allowed to grow up as I was on an island ranch and having to operate it as it had been for the last hundred years. And it built quite a bit of fortitude and it built quite a bit of sense of self-esteem and, and we're tied to this land. We didn't want to go out of the cattle business. And so for me, I can't say I'm at peace with it. This really starts with my great-grandfather, Walter Vale. He was a young man in his early 20s from the East Coast, a Yankee, and came out west to find his fortune, and in 1870 started in Sonoida and started a ranch. Like many of those ranchers in the 1890s, they started to push west to find other lands to graze their cattle. Walter, along with his a partner and another rancher local to him in Arizona, J.V. Vickers, formed a partnership to purchase this island. The operation became known as Vale and Vickers on Santa Rosa Island. What was nice about it for me was the generational knowledge that just kept coming down the pipeline to me. So that's how this ranch came to be. There was a lot of knowledge and a lot of stories and a lot of culture to this place that uh, I was a recipient of. As young kids, we spent much of the summer here terrorizing the workers here and getting in their way, which we enjoyed. This is the stable area where all the cowhands kept their saddles and bridles, and this was the first job I had. It was making sure this was swept out every morning before the hands even arrived. Can we stand around here so we can get a good look at this house? We sure can. Because this house looks like it may have been here for a while. Been here for a long time. She's built a uh... Uh, sometime in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. You're talking about 1860s? 18, right. So it's uh, well over 100 years old. Yeah. Well, I happened to be working in a regional office in downtown Omaha, Nebraska in early 1974. I got this call from the regional director and he offered me the superintendency of Channel Islands National Monument. And I said, where is that? And they said, well, it's off the coast of Southern California out of Santa Barbara. And so I came out here and the first weekend I was here, I got in a boat and went out and I looked at Anna Cap and I thought, wow, what a magnificent place this is. And then I started reading and finding out that, hey, there was a talk about a national park back as early as the 1930s. And wow, maybe there's a chance someday to do something like this. I met the Vales and they were the most honest person you ever met and a handshake to them meant everything. You had to build their trust, and it took a lot of time uh, being with them and proving to them that I was an honest person too, and you know, build a friendship. I kept asking, you know, and saying, hey, you know, think, think I could come out and go on one of these roundups sometime? And well, let's wait a little while, you know, and a couple of years went by. It was like 1978, as I recall, and, so I came out here all excited and stuff, and I didn't have a saddle at that time until I got this one right here. I came out and started on the first ride, and we started gathering cattle. That day started at 3 in the morning for the poor guy that had to go out into the house pasture and run in the working horses. And it would be real windy in the morning and dark and cold. You'd get on that horse at the barn there, and you'd start trotting. I mean, you would trot halfway across this island, and then you'd ride down these canyons and gather what cattle they are, and you'd funnel them in to China Camp here. They used to have a ranch farm in here, 
named Bill Wallace. His nephew worked as one of the cowboys out here. They had made a ride to China camp, carried a small pistol with him, and he put it in his back pocket, climbed on the horse, shot himself right through the rear end, and had to ride 14 miles back horseback at, at night. And they find the bullet that was in his boot. It went right down and into his boot. But you gotta be tough. Double tough. If you want to ride 14 miles after shooting yourself in the rear end with a, with a 22. Yeah, there was, there was lots of good times, I mean, uh, you know. These vaqueros in my time period had transitioned to mostly coming out of the high Sonoran Mexican desert. Their work ethic was incredible. Most of them are here for most of their lives. They, they were very loyal. Uh, my father started working for the Vale family in the early 40s. Then they asked him if he would want to come to an island. He didn't know anything about it. He said, sure. And they brought him out to Santa Rosa Island. Pretty quickly, he became the foreman. Once he got married in the late 50s, he brought my mom out here. This is the house that I grew up in, so most of my memories are of this place and of this view. On a day like today, my mom would call it, there's popcorn on the water. But to answer your question, I did not start knowing I want to work out for the Park Service. I never thought about being a ranger at all. This is the lead way up to the pier where we would run our cattle and the, it was a job we all competed for as, as kids on horses. We'd have to load these cattle on the boat and they did not want to run down this pier. So we'd open the gates and actually stampede them down the pier into the funnel chutes there and down into the vaquero. They had a boat called the Vaquero. They were built specifically to haul cattle. The one I'm familiar with was the Vaquero II. It's only five and a half hours before we need Now you're doing a pretty good job, Bill. We'd run from 3,000 to 7,000 head of cattle here a year. And the pier wasn't as nice as this one is then. It was a wood pier that we just continually you know, repaired and rebuilt. It was, it was good, but in the winter storms here sometimes, They'd come in, the waves would come in over this pier, over the end of it. My forefathers learned very quickly not to nail down the planks, just let the waves bring them and toss them on the beach, because otherwise they would have pulled the pilings out. And then we'd go and collect them off the beach and rebuild the pier again. And it was a vital part of not just moving the cattle, but moving supplies off of this island. The vaquero came with the mail and supplies once every couple of weeks, which was a big day for us. It's kind of a life to itself. It's more or less your own world. It's about the only place left that is the Old West. Why do you think that is? Well, because it has, it's not overrun with people. There's not motorcycles, automobiles, and whatnot running all over. And we do everything on horseback, just like we did years ago. And uh, be nice to uh, continue this, but as uh, modern times come, it's, it's on its way out.